We're not letting them divide us no more. We have given this country everything. When you have these protesters to go out, they say, hands up, don't shoot, right? When we go out, we're armed. You know what the police say? They look at us and they say, it's not worth it. One of the pandemic's enduring legacies will be more Americans with guns. We have seen a dramatic rise in the number of groups that support gun rights for LGBTQ people, for people of color. The events of 2020 highlighted the growing complexity of gun rights and mixed attitudes on the Second Amendment. With the chaos of the election, and people were getting emboldened and stuff, so it was something that I felt needed to do for my family and the future of our baby. Our biggest supporters have actually been leftists, have been socialists, progressives. You sort of have to have a distrust of authority. You know, the police and the government aren't taking care of me, so I have to, you know, do things on my own. Will growing support for gun rights on the political left impact the partisan divide on gun control? Back when you needed the black vote so you could beat Trump, show me where that worked for us. If they're killing people now and we have guns, imagine what would happen if we didn't have them. Our only means is to protect ourselves with firearms to even the playing field. I grew up um, in the Chicagoland area. And so I've seen a lot of violence, but I also saw people who were law-abiding citizens didn't really have the means to defend themselves because of the laws. We're talking about a Democrat area, a stronghold. They pass gun laws and prevent law-abiding citizens from owning firearms. And I knew that wasn't right. Yep, just like that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nick Bezel served in the military and resettled in Texas. He founded the Elmer Geronimo Pratt Gun Club to help advocate for black Americans exercising their Second Amendment rights. The gun club is named after a high-ranking member of the Black Panther Party during the 1960s and 70s. Bezel did not feel comfortable disclosing the group's membership numbers, but confirmed a high volume of new inquiries since 2020. Yeah, that's looking good today. Which, you, you ate your Wheaties this morning? Or? I did. Okay, okay. The Texas state legislature passed over a dozen bills in 2021 that expanded gun rights, including one permitless carry bill that allows most individuals 21 or older to purchase and carry arms without training or a permit. Hey, how you been? All right, how you been doing? I'm good, good. good, good. So this isn't just like your typical gym workout. You, this no. is a, a real purpose to this. Yeah, this is a purpose behind it. This is to actually simulate wearing all my gear. So when I actually have to put it on and use it, it's almost like second nature. I want it to be as light as possible so it's not affecting me um, moving or even noticing that I have this extra weight on. Yeah. And you have to think about wearing this vest versus wearing some of your tactical gear exactly. because you don't want to cause alarm. I'm 6'3", 235 pounds. I mean, I'm already a big guy to start with. And then when you start having all this gear on, yeah. if I'm out here with an open carrying with a rifle, it's gonna cause panic. And the only thing people are gonna say is, you know what the description is gonna be. There's a black guy in the park with a tactical gear on. We don't know what he's doing. There'll be helicopters in the sky, SWAT team will pull up, weapons drawn, not knowing that I'm a law-abiding citizen. So are you carrying now? Guns are flying off the shelves with political change and social unrest contributing to the rise, according to the ATF. Yeah, I've seen a big uptick in AR-15s. Anybody who doesn't have one wants to get one now. 2020 was a record year for gun purchases. The consulting firm Small Arms Analytics and Forecasting estimates 23 million firearms were sold in 2020, compared to 13.9 million in 2019. Well, we've definitely seen a pretty stark increase in gun purchases uh, during the COVID year. You know, when your life gets turned upside down and you feel that the things that you rely on for security and safety just don't seem to be there anymore, there's more interest in purchasing a gun. Is there a rise in the number of, let's say, minority-focused 
gun groups? We have seen a dramatic rise in the number of groups that uh, support gun rights for LGBTQ people, for people of color, and for other left-leaning groups in recent years. However, we should still put it in context. Those groups are still few and far between. In 2020, it's estimated of roughly 8.5 million first-time gun buyers, 40% were women, and purchases made by African Americans increased 56% compared to 2019. I just don't know where, the, where all the diapers are gonna go. What about, the, these are zero to six, so we can probably hang these up, right? I was born and raised in San Antonio. Growing up, my dad was aware of a lot of the racism that they experienced um, when they first moved to San Antonio in the 80s. Jackie Garcia and her wife Talia have been married for six years. Even though they recently moved to a diverse suburb of Dallas, Garcia says they still struggle with bias. So cute. <laughs> My wife is a feminine representing lesbian, so she can go out by herself and they'll just assume, well, she's expecting her husband's baby. She, she passes as a, a straight woman, but once they see us together and they see how I look with my short hair and the clothes that I wear, they're like, oh, okay, you're a gay couple, and she notices the stairs more than I do. And when did you decide that it was time to get trained up on, on guns? It had to be during the election, this past election. So this is season. very recent. Yes. When we were living in Roanoke, Texas, we're surrounded by a lot of affluent white people that, although some were nice, there was a majority of Trump supporters um, in that town, and... Um, just seeing that, that filter come off and seeing the stairs. They, they eye you up and down with this stern look of like, what are you doing here, you know? And for not being white or for being or gay, a gay couple? Or, yeah, or gay couple. As the election was coming up in November, it just felt like tensions were constantly rising. And, you know, and January 6th happened and, and all that stuff that it was very nerve wracking, all that pressure building up, it, it made me a little nervous for sure. I carry, whenever I'm out, I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. It's always been my, my philosophy for a lot. Garcia is a member of the Latino Rifle Association, a politically progressive group aiming to connect Latino gun owners and educate Latino communities on firearms and self-defense. I was getting my hair cut and my barber, she's a lesbian Latina and she was also thinking about getting her license to carry too and I'm just like, sweet, there's another member there. I know he's actively trying to talk to people there. Yeah, I feel like our firearms section is sort of on the back burner right now. I'm the founder and president of the Latino Rifle Association, you know, born and raised right here in Sacramento, California. This is a Ruger PC9 pistol caliber carbine. This fires a nine millimeter bullets, which is typically a handgun round, but it fires it clearly through a rifle. This is a burst of firestorm, a near exact copy of the Walther PPK, which is the gun that James Bond uses. PB Gomez is a 23 year old law student at UC Berkeley. He purchased his first gun in 2018 before the state of California changed the minimum age to purchase firearms from 18 to 21 years old. Today, we're gonna to be looking at the Firestorm by Bursa. Since its formation in 2020, the Latino Rifle Association already has several hundred members across the US. Our biggest supporters have actually have been leftists, have been socialists, have been progressives, have been, you know, in America would be considered far left. Because from the beginning, we made it very clear what this was, that this is not the NRA for brown people. Gun culture in the United States is largely toxic and it's not welcoming and it's, for a specific demographic. If you don't look a certain way, don't think a certain way, you know, it doesn't seem very friendly. I knew that if the Latino community was going to explore firearms, I wanted it to be from a different perspective and sort of an opportunity to be away from sort of the traditional gun ownership, which I found sort of repulsive and toxic and unsafe. And I didn't think it would be good for the Latino community to sort of just be thrown into. Why did you decide to start this organization? So the thing that originally put it in my mind was actually the El Paso shooting. 
This morning, the suspected gunman who opened fire at a mall in El Paso may face hate crime charges. Armed officers ran through the mall yesterday where at least 20 people were killed. You know, just, just horrific, just a white supremacist just going into Walmart and just mass murdering people and like explicitly for the purpose of trying to create fear to like drive Latinos out of the country. Like that's what his manifesto said. The nonprofit Every Town for Gun Safety says mass shootings are largely preventable through evidence-based policy interventions, such as universal background checks and red flag laws that enable courts to temporarily revoke an individual's access to guns. 100 rounds in Dayton, 30 round clips in El Paso. They'll be banned. Gun policy is a politically polarizing issue, with a partisan divide growing wider in the past decade. Democrats don't want to address the consistent, proven, empirical failure of gun control laws. They don't work, and they make crime worse. Every Democratic candidate wants to ban assault weapons, wants to institute magazine capacities. But I'm, you know, I'm not a single issue voter, you know. I don't vote for Republicans because I'm scared of losing my gun rights. Like, it's not, it's not a single issue for me. But at the same time, you know, I'm someone who I don't feel represented by either of the political parties. Does gun regulation specifically impact communities of color? Of course, you know, anytime you're giving additional laws to enforce additional felonies in the book, it's gonna impact poor communities, it's gonna impact communities of color the hardest. You know, when you give police a new mandate, like, hey, we have to get X weapons off the street, or we have to enforce uh, people have a license, you know, that just expands the purview of police powers, which almost inadvertently leads to, you know, unfavorable confrontations between police and communities that traditionally just distrust the police. You sort of have to have a distrust of authority. You, you sort of have to fundamentally believe, like, you know, the police and the government aren't taking care of me, so I have to, you know, do things on my own. For the last decade, Austin has been among the fastest growing cities in the country. But fast-paced development brought rapid gentrification that's hit black communities especially hard. According to the city of Austin, African Americans comprised nearly 17% of the city's population in 1940. In 2020, they made up less than 7%. And numbers are expected to continue to fall. So this area, this is East Austin, uh, a historically black area of Austin you know, historically embedded into the community. This is where they all grew up at, they all hung out at, at this park down here. As this area continues to be gentrified, there have been calls for them to close the park down and then reopen the park as a dog park. And so that just further shows um, how gentrification leads to displacement of the black community um, from their historic neighborhoods. According to the local nonprofit Ending Community Homelessness Coalition, African Americans represent 40% of Austin's homeless population. So we come out here every Sunday um, and try to give back to the community. So this is a weekly event for us. <laughs> Thank y'all, man. Appreciate all right, it, man. all right, all right. We find it beneficial and rewarding to come out here and try to help people as much as we can, whether it's feeding them, whether it's trying to find them housing. Um, just because we're a gun club doesn't mean we're all about guns. We also have to give back to our community. Um, as I was pulling up this morning, I heard a lot of commotion. Um, I started seeing a bunch of police cars, about seven to eight police cars out here. I went live on Facebook to try to capture the interaction. Um, and I noticed they had an a, a elderly black man um, up against the vehicle. They had all their weapons drawn, uh, lethal and non-lethal weapons. You could clearly hear a lot of people saying, you were lucky that you didn't get shot. And I just think that's the climate that we're in in America that any time that you live through a police interaction, that's a good day. You feel as though being armed at all times is, offers you a degree of protection, right? Given what we've seen with, with policing in America, the simple fact that you are armed, right, that raises the temperature significantly. Doesn't that put you at greater risk of, of clashing with the police, who may ultimately decide you're a threat and we need to take action right now? Right. Well, first and foremost, everybody's entitled to self-preservation. I don't care who it is. And I don't advocate violence, but I do advocate self-defense. We keep talking about what's the purpose of firearms is to even the playing field. 
when do we close the racial wealth gap so we can even the playing field? They won't allow, they, this is slow genocide is what we're living through. They gentrify areas, they displace us, we're refugees in our own country, and they refuse to do anything to fix it. The Elmer Geronimo Pratt Gun Club is involved in political issues beyond the Second Amendment and gun training. The gun club members say they're frustrated because they feel the Biden administration hasn't done enough to move black interests forward. Back when you needed the black vote to push you over the top so you could beat Trump, show me where that worked for us and tell us what we got for that. All of these agendas are being met. Where is the black agenda? Why is it not being met and why was it not being met first? Generally, when we talk about those in support of Second Amendment, st strong Second Amendment, are Republicans. Right. And, and then everyone else is a Democrat. Right. Given your position, mm -hmm. I'm curious to know mm -hmm. where that strict partisan divide right. hits you. Right. Um, I don't care one way or another about a political party. Um, as I've grown and evolved, I've realized that <laughs> both parties are just a different side to the same coin. The black American vote has long been the, the bedrock of the Democratic Party. And with a growing number of black Americans picking up arms, many for the very first time, to defend themselves, find that the party that they've been loyal to for so long is pushing for more gun restrictions. Does that endanger the Democratic Party's grip on? I think it does. I think. Again, this last election cycle, I think you found a lot of people who traditionally voted Democrat did the same thing that I did, and they withheld their vote um, for, for multiple reasons. As long as we're giving our vote away for free, I don't see them ever um, correcting course and doing something tangible for us. You've been taken for granted. Of course. Of course. Everybody's abused us for over 400 years. While black voters generally view the Democratic Party positively, more than half felt the party has not done enough for the African-American community, according to a 2020 survey conducted by Black Pack, a political action committee. There has been a long racist history of gun control laws. Now that's not to tar all gun control laws. Gun, gun laws are part of American law, and American law has been unfortunately deeply infected by racism. Uh, the Founding Fathers had racially restrictive gun laws, for instance, prohibiting in Virginia African Americans from possessing firearms. Uh, after the Civil War in, in southern states, one of the ways in which they tried to keep African Americans second-class citizens was by denying them access to guns, along with other constitutional rights. Uh, and then in the 1960s, when you had not only the Black Power movement, but also significant racial unrest in major American cities like Detroit, and New Jersey, and Los Angeles. Um, some of that violence in those cities was attributed to the easy access uh, to firearms. And so the 1960s saw just sort of an effort to promote gun control, um, not in the name of keeping African Americans from possessing firearms, but in practice, that was one of the ways in which these gun control laws worked. The Mulford Act, a bill prohibiting the public carry of loaded firearms in California, was signed into law by Governor Ronald Reagan in 1967. Legally armed members of the Black Panthers protested an earlier version of the bill at the California Assembly in May of that year, making national news. In contrast to the NRA's opposition to gun control today, the NRA backed gun control laws in the 60s. You know, you look at Philando Castillo, who was a gun owner in Minnesota. He had a gun permit, a valid gun permit. He had a valid firearm in his car. So where was the NRA then? Where was the NRA in the 60s when the Panthers were exercising their right? So again, why do we need black gun organizations? It's because nobody else will help us. Nobody else will stand with us. If, if they're killing people now, and we have guns, imagine what would happen if we didn't have them. Our only means is to protect ourselves with firearms, because if we don't, we're already going through a slow genocide. This year marked the 100-year anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, when a white mob destroyed the prosperous black neighborhood of Greenwood, also known as Black Wall Street. Although some members of the black community were armed, between 75 and 300 Greenwood residents were brutally killed. 
The financial toll of the 1921 race massacre is estimated to amount over $200 million in property damage. When we talk about reparations, we can't have that conversation without Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we also can't talk about black self-defense without Tulsa, Oklahoma being mentioned. Bezel, along with several other groups, organized an open carry march to commemorate the centennial of the Tulsa massacre. Geronimo Fick, the Geronimo action. Some groups that participated in the march have been criticized for extremist views. There are several pro-Second Amendment groups that have gathered here for what will be an armed march through the streets of Tulsa, which is not something you see every day. And they say that being armed is really the only way to prevent something horrific like that from happening again. I guess, why be armed in the first place? Since George Floyd was murdered, you see protesters go out. But when you have these protesters go out, they say, hands up, don't shoot, right? What you're telling the police is, I'm unarmed, the people around me are unarmed, you can brutalize us, and there's absolutely nothing that we can do to defend ourselves. When we go out, we're armed. Now we've evened the playing field. You know what the police say? They look at us and they say, it's not worth it to engage those guys. We ain't turning our back on our sisters and brothers no more. We're not letting them divide us no more. We have given this country everything. What was the significance of the Tulsa Centennial um, in which you had hundreds of black Americans taking to the streets and open carrying? without incident. I think this was a remarkable display of um, support for the idea that African Americans need to defend themselves, that they can't rely on uh, the white government to really protect them, on the police forces to protect them. Um, and carrying guns openly in the way that they did is really a, a way of showing force, like we are not to be messed with. Um, unfortunately, in America, we're seeing a lot of people take up arms and carry them openly as a way of sort of suggesting to others, don't mess with us. It's probably uh, destructive of political debate uh, and of the kind of community that we really need to have uh, to move forward on the major issues that confront America. We just want to live. We want to live like everybody else. Is it so difficult for people to understand that we don't want to be on camera for nine or ten minutes watching our brothers or our sisters, watching their life leave their body. We built this land, our ancestors built this land. We fought in every war. We've never turned our back on America. America's turned its back on us. And I just think people wanted to defend themselves or at least make an attempt to defend themselves. That's it. Hey, thanks for checking out CBS and Originals on YouTube. If you want to watch more documentaries, download the free CBS News app on your phone, tablet, smart TV, or any streaming device. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking down here. Thanks for watching.